testing? Is that good? Yeah, okay. So I'm gonna start off with, over the summer there was a photo that came out. Um, don't, I don't recommend looking it up, but it was a um, migrant father and daughter from El Salvador who drowned in the Rio Grande. Um, and so anyone in Poetry Workshop knows Don was um, kind of blasting a crisis. So I'm, that was, this is what I wrote after that. So spiritual crisis for migrant father and daughter face down in the riverbank. Some weeks my dad wanted to leave. And so we left, my brothers and I packed with the tent in the back of the truck, windows open to the state parks, stop by stop the smell of diesel diner booths, and then arrival somewhere in the trees. We must have spent months standing in parking lots, standing on piers, hands in our pockets, dad speaking to a ranger or untangling our fishing line, summoning fire of the cold, wet, broken branches on the ground. For us, he did everything. My favorite was when we'd ride the water, have you a kayak or canoe, We'd skim the green surface. There I saw the gator, eyes, a turtle jumping off a rock. Sometimes the boat flipped, the sky reversed, a moment choking on the current, the sun under our turning legs, hair wet for hours. Sometimes I asked to go and he said no or else said nothing. And I'll bet you thought I'd talk about the photo, like I'd have wisdom to throw against a drowned pair of strangers. My father jumping into the rapids, yelling something, grabbing somebody, one of us overboard, some rock, blood, thrashing white water. If it had happened, he would have done it. I asked him once and he said he would follow us in. He would have dug and dug and dug past my limp head sealed in the mud. He would have dug for that part of me that left and never found it. The way you dig into your mind for meaning when you stare at that photo and will not ever know what were they thinking the first time they went under or the first time they resurfaced or the second or the last. Okay, and then this one's kind of long, so I'm gonna close this. Um, this was written after the hurricane in Puerto Rico in 2017. So it's called Maria Revelations, and it kind of goes through a few different voices. So. One, Ave. God called himself a man and made me into a woman while I dreamed my way. And then I woke up to him coying over my stillness, wringing his hands in hope of my agreement to his plan, of the yes he begged of me in my own home. I must accept the unclothing when he says virgin. I say virgin too. And know if man, then when he thinks of women, he considers his own dick. Two, reigning men. So the news shouted, the spout dribbled into smelly reaches, slid excellently across the grit-stained surface before the snap of its bursting oil plunged heartward like a knife and broke a city at the bone. It came from a high place called a blessing with lightning force and wind-like grunts over the hairy curves of the land. It washed around the island, her shanties, potholes, bogs, beauty marks called blemishes until it gathered itself enough to overcome. It overcame them all the same until the overcoming was all. Three, Padre in his voice. I suppose I am a whorish call. Katrina was a nice lay, easy but boring. She was the kind of girl who felt I disappointed her and the faggot Harvey thought he saw it better than I did. Maria had me thinking I was a new man. She came from out of town, so how was she going to hear about me? She couldn't know. To me, she was a disaster worth bringing home for Christmas. Wide eyes, tight as fuck, I could tell, but I'm a gentleman. 
mind a trophy, my opportunity woman, salvage this small one and my children might know I led a piece of life working as a nurse. I like my crosses red. Who am I? I read that question in a magazine that belonged to someone else. You have to stop thinking I'm simply America. I am mostly the weather. I have been known to fill a world up to the brim. I don't care, but I am not a man. I am the man, the hugest he. Daddy both to women and their kids. Four, Proud Mary interlude. We know giving gifts is taking, but so too is worship fear. I have known two millennia of men and have allowed their weight to ferment in my core. I cook salvation and serve, and their chanting of my name is recompense and terror that I may shut the kitchen down. Good. I have developed a new purpose for their offerings. Who do you think held on to that frankincense and myrrh? The world's so-called sympathies have been thrown towards heaven and caked around me like mud. 2,000 years I've melted that shit down to forge my knives. And five, assumption. Lest anyone forget how this became sweat, how he hammered on me for hours, then hours. Then the clapboard shattered, stench drooled into the air, musked through the sheets, marked its spot on the lease. My lips tortured to an O. I let 1,427 gasps escape. And failing to hold them back, he licked them out of me until he finished. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> um, so I'm working on a collection about mothers and daughters. Um, this is one of the stories from that. It's very new. I wrote it less than a week ago and then rewrote half of it like three hours ago. So this is a work in progress here. All right. Sitch broke through her shell and reached bloody limbs toward the sky. She glistened in the dawn, amniotic fluid streaking her scales, shreds of membrane veiling her triangular head. Around her, the other eggs quaked and shook, cracks spidering the shells. Her eyes, vast bottomless orbs, drank in the dawn light. When her brother, lighter than her, smaller than her, emerged from his shell, Sitch's serrated fangs and scythe-like talons were waiting. Her sister brother met the same fate, as did the rest of her siblings. She was the first. She would be the only. Sitch named herself for the sound of scales and pale flesh parting and claws lodging in still soft bone. Her nostrils flared wide, drinking in the smells of birthing and dying on the morning breeze. She abandoned the nest where she had dreamed for a full revolution of the moon. She slid into the dark undergrowth around her, scales washing clean in the salty marsh-like brew. Her engorged belly threatened to drag her down, but Sitch's limbs were burned with blood and sunrise, and she lashed her powerful, t powerful tail to propel herself forward. She found a burrow without difficulty, she tore into the oblation of the burrow's former inhabitants, blood consecrating stone. The pale, wavering sun faded away and night bloomed above her. Sitch's eyes, all four of them, glistened like mirrors as she gazed outward. She wrapped her tail around herself, delicate fins collapsing into invisibility, but for the coruscating moonlight across their edges. Sitch grew quickly, molted scales littering her nest and creating a shifting shale that gleamed with remembered radiance. She hunted and occasionally fought in the gloaming. Shadowy creatures surged from the depths beneath her to demand their tithes of flesh, the gaping wounds they left behind healing into twisted whirls of pale scales, galaxies writ small. As she aged, Sitch resembled less and less the smooth watercolor sky of dawn and dusk, becoming akin to the pitted curtain of night. Sitch eventually stopped growing, settling into her adult form. Her savage head sliced through marsh and undergrowth with ease, captured starlight flickering like lightning along the muscles of her spine. 
One night, when the other moons were bright in the sky, Sitch felt something shudder through her bones, burning its way through her stomachs, coursing deep in her veins. She abandoned her burrow, a large shadow slipping free in a land awash with shadows. She undulated through the surface of the water, a strange keen quivering in the back of her throat. She hunted, or she searched. For such they were one and the same. Above her, a comet flared, bright and cold, slicing through the sky like a reflection of the scene below. Such hardly noticed the dying blaze, so focused was she on the desire within her. They came to her in the dark, the males who were smaller by half than such, the not males, the not females, the ones who would incubate her eggs once she laid them, protecting the offspring until they were ready to hatch. Such twisted and twined as they met her, limbs sliding together, tails curving and guiding, fins flaring and contracting. In the coiling knot, Such alone shone, a wavering beacon of ghost light beneath the water. It was inevitable in such a writhing throng. A claw sliced through scale, blood spilled into the water, and a more familiar hunger awoke in Such. Her ecstasy edged toward violence, teeth catching and tugging, tails lashing harshly as she pulled her lover's bodies beneath her. The not males, not females who guarded the right drew back, out of reach of Such's sacrificial talons. She tore the offerings to pieces and they gave themselves to her, spent and ready. The salty marsh foamed with blood, viscera churning around Such's form as she hallowed herself. The fire banked and Such calmed, ripples spreading outward from where she floated. The disembodied remains of torn limbs sank, tracing lazy paths into the darkness. Slowly, Such began to wend her way back to her burrow. Almost invisible in the night, the watchers followed, trailing behind her in an eldritch procession. Such gestated. As she lay curled in her burrow, the watchers brought her prey, sacrifices to sate her hunger. She gazed at the stars, the passing of dawn and dusk, and her dark eyes consumed the light, feeding it to the children within her. Her body swelled in preparation, hardened outer scales splitting apart to reveal the nacreous scales beneath. Soon, she no longer lashed out at the watchers, no longer caught the unwary in the tips of her claws. She slumbered, body awkwardly curled around her distended abdomen. Finally, she was ready. When the first stars pulsed in the sky, she stirred, old scales sloughing off as she shifted her gravid form. The watchers gathered around her. Such clambered to the edge of the burrow and fell into the water. She sank, stone light, dull and lightless. But the watchers were ready. They slid their forms beneath her, tails curled around her limbs, and lifted her laboriously back to the surface. Lashed together, the watchers pulled Sitch's bloated form through the marsh. When they reached their destination, Sitch did not recognize the underbrush, the claw marks, the echoes of a bloody dawn. She did not think at all. She existed in a darkness far more complete than the night that had fallen around her. Beneath the attentive gaze of the creatures who'd cared for her, worshipped her, Sitch gave birth. Her body contorted and pulsed as she laid egg after egg, speckles shell, speckled shells hardening in the starlight. When she was done, Sitch rested, eyes slowly falling open to swallow the sky once more. The watchers gathered the eggs reverently, abandoning the shell of their mother. Sitch was left alone, stinking of birthing fluid, vulnerable in the dark. The undergrowth around her was still and quiescent. It was not until dawn came that Sitch shifted, stiff limbs a parody of her former grace. Stomach flaccid, she staggered into the water. She was alone. The marsh was smooth around her. Motes of pale sun curled once more along the edges of her scales, and her tail twitched as strength rekindled in the altar of her bones. Such swam through groves unfamiliar to her, wandering, eyes open wide as darkness washed from her mind. She passed an unusual crater, pausing for a moment to examine the large hollow where the undergrowth had been ripped violently away. She swam on. 
Her fins began to burn as water tore through them like netting. Sitch thrashed and struggled, seeking the relative solidity of a rocky outcropping. She pulled herself out of the bracken. The light was dying, and all throughout the sky, stars unveiled their cold faces. Sitch gazed up at them as her body disappeared, first fin, then tail tip, then the far reaches of her limbs. She was not in pain, as she had been birthing the sparks of her children. She did not think of them, nor of the watchers who now cared for them. She saw only the void of the sky above, a void that called to its twin within her. Such disappeared slowly, blood sanctifying the rock on which she crouched. Her four eyes blinked together, and in their depths, a new fire kindled. She awoke beneath the water. The ocean was clear, reflecting the galaxies above her, so dark and pure and wide that the whole world was the night sky writ large. Sitch broke the surface of the water and reached glistening limbs to the stars. Hey. Um, first, thank you to Ariel and Josh for putting this together. I was gonna start with gratitude. Um, this is like my third time sharing fiction, so I'm excited to share it with y'all. And I, what I chose to read is something I started working on last summer when I met Angie, so it felt kind of full circle to read it here. Um, it's part of a project I'm working on that is called From the Sea to the Mountain, about this kid named Delmar Almonte, who lives in the Bronx. He um, is 16, his best friend's name is Claribel, you'll hear that name. Um, what else? He lives in the Bronx. There's this kid named Jorge that he's trying to figure out a few things. Does he want to be like Jorge? Does he want to be with Jorge? He doesn't know. And he is an, a seasonal employee at Bargains USA, which is a, a, a thrift store in his neighborhood. Okay. Anna was one of those people that shook Delmar with her confidence. She was a lot like his best friend, Claudia Bell, in that she, didn't, she hadn't given a fuck since the day her mama brought her into this chaotic world. Anna took a long drag of her Marlboro Light, the one she snatched from her boss's cubby, as she flicked it onto the sidewalk. You going to the freedom party? She asked Delmar. The what party? Delmar responded. Bruh, are you deaf? Maybe if you took those headphones out your ears and stopped acting like you didn't know nobody, you'd know what I was talking about. She snapped back and smiled. I'm fucking with you. She laughed a little. The freedom party is the place to be for people like us, she winked. Delmar paused with confusion. Like us? You know, us, she winked again. Delmar wasn't sure what she meant. Everyone knew that Anna had been kissing girls and boys since before he'd gotten to high school. Everyone knew that she was that kid. She probably should have been the president of the Love is Love Club at school, but she was too busy living her life in between work and summer and after school shifts to support her mom. I don't know what you mean by us. I don't go that way, Anna. Delmar quickly cleaned the air between them. OK, whatever you say, Delmar. If you do change your mind, the party is this Saturday at Reese Beach. It's kind of far, but it's perfect. All day at the beach, beautiful people, a little bud, a little drink, popping. Anna li lifted her head as she imagined herself toasting in the sun at the far edge of New York. Delmar shrugged his shoulders and made his way back into the store. He had another hour left before his shift was over. Inside the store, his manager was watching the security monitors. He was too cheap to hire security. The business hadn't been doing as well as when it first opened, and the summer was an invitation for uninvited guests. Delmar made his way to the houseware section to clean up the aisle and kill some time in the last hour of his shift. He decided to color code the glasses to make it more appealing. He arranged the off-white matching pair of wicker chairs on top of the faux fur carpet to create the kind of living room he was happy his mother Gladys didn't have a taste for, the type of furniture arrangement she would talk shit about after visiting someone's house. While arranging the picture frame, something caught his eye. There were two figures, thin men that looked like him, but in another era. The background of the picture in the small golden frame was mostly washed out, but he could make out that it was a beach, a white sand beach. The two men in the foreground were near the shore. The one closest to the water was beaming. He looked off to the distance as if another photographer had grabbed his attention first. He was lean, not skinny and his legs were thick like a dancer. 
His right calf bulged as he stood on the balls of his foot and pointed the other leg towards the ocean. His arms made a perfect L shape. The man behind him stand, stood with a slightly more apprehensive look on his face, perhaps why he did not take center stage. Where the tips of the first man's hands ended, the next man's hands began. He held him up in a slightly more conservative dancer stance. The two stood there together, matching high-waisted, low-length swim trunks, almost too close to simply be friends. Delmar's heart skipped a small beat as he brushed his fingers against the glass. Maybe I'll go to the party. After work that day, Delmar needed to talk to his best friend. Was he the only person at Sonia Pierre High School who hadn't heard of the Freedom Party? Gladibel was a sophomore too, so she must have been as much in the dark as he was, right? He dialed his friend's number with apprehension on the phone in the back office after clocking out for the day. I'll be there in 10 minutes. Want anything from the outside world while I'm here? Honey glazed chips, please. Two 50 cent bags. Don't bring me those little 25 cent bags. You the best, she responded. Bachata blasted from the corner speaker at the bodega. The store's cat crossed over refrigerated vegetables and low wage earnings slapped on worn bulletproof countertops in a rhythm of sorts. They didn't have honey glazed chips. Who eats that anyways, he thought to himself. A bag of barbecue lays would have to do. Gladibel lived about a block away from Delmar's job on Walton. The streets were hot and buzzing in July. The smoke hit Delmar's nose before he could see the coals smoldering below cheeseburgers. Like bees to a hive, a small crowd danced around the entrance of her building. A grill was set up to the left of the door and a few people sang along to music from the car parked at the curb. Delmar smiled and gave a light nod to the group as he made his way towards the intercom. When he got upstairs to Gladibel's apartment, it felt hotter. There were fans circulating humid air like at home, but it felt thicker up there on the fifth floor. Hey, Elle, want the good news or the bad news? Delmar half smiled. Come on, Elle, it's too hot for this. Give me my chips. She snatched the small black, the small black plastic bag from him. Is there another bag? Gladibel asked. Nah, they didn't have the chips you wanted, Delmar shrugged. So what's the good news? Oh, um, I got invited to a party. A party? When? Where? You're going, right? Well, I'm not sure. You know Anna, the junior? Senior now, I guess. Yeah, she's cool. What about her? Oh, wait, you got invited to that party? Huh? No, she called, she called it the Freedom Party. Oh, it's the gayest thing at school. And you know everyone from school goes because it's the best party of the summer. So are you going to go? I mean... I don't go that way, but Anna is real cool, and it's the end of the summer, and we've never been to that beach, so, so you want to go. You know I'm down. But what if people see us? What if what, if what Delmar? Why are you so pressed about who's going to see us? We going to see us. Delmar slowly opened his zebra kick and bit into it. The thick frosted coating crumbled around his lips as he bit further into it. I'll just join you, Delmar responded in a low voice. Bet, Claudia Bell smiled. Delmar didn't have anything to wear to the beach, let alone a party. He hadn't gone to the beach since the family trip to Santo Domingo two summers ago to celebrate his middle school graduation. He imagined Jorge at the party. Maybe they'd finally have a conversation. We're going to, the, to a party, El, uh, to the party. Wait, what are we going to wear? Gladibel rummaged through the overstuffed closet behind the door to her room. I mean, I still have those trunks I wore the last time we went to DR, so I think I'm good. Delmar gave Gladibel a look of concern. The party was only a few days away, and the two friends were unsure of their outfits for this summer fest and had no idea how to get somewhere that far off their corner. Digging for, for some security, Delmar dipped his hands into his pockets to calm the growing speed of his thumping chest. Wait, what are we going to tell our moms? Delmar pulled out the little flyer Anna had given him at work from his left pocket. You worry about the wrong things, hermano. We'll tell them we are hanging out at each other's house, duh. Gladibel snatched the crumbled paper from her best friend's hand and unraveled it to reveal its contents. She smiled as she saw the word freedom in big black letters at the top. We're going to have an amazing weekend, she thought to herself. Hello, friends. Um, I had a teacher tell me once that all writers apologize, and she called it the pre-apology before their work. So I'm not going to do that. But I did, like Annie, write most of these very recently. So that's... My caveat, okay. <clears throat> okay, I'm just gonna do that. 
How is it to be trapped in the self? Jesus is on the cross, and all I can focus on is how uncomfortable it is not to wear shoes. The guard spears his ribs, and then a shower of blood. Blood in the belly, blood in the throat. When I see him, all I can feel is the body within my body. At the viaduct, the Hudson in March, 14 days since he fell under. I watch his mama fling a lone golden lent lily into the swollen gorge. Cycle. February again, and I bleed through the same jeans I wore when I saw you last. I can't help but think this is a tasteless sign from God or elsewhere, your blue swelled figure still dripping, when I fill the basin and watch blood clouds pollute sink water, faucet pounding life into soaked denim, the same angry cascade. I don't move when the trickle starts to collect under my feet. I want to know how it felt to suspend like drifting indigo, float months in quiet cold, only to be recovered from the docks, car keys still hooked to a tattered belt loop. Sunday morning. I wake as the sun perverts itself through the window. Outside, the river sings in its vague language, pulled not toward a destination, but carried through itself and ending everywhere. It reminds me of the God they say breathes through the pages of the worn Bible on my nightstand, the Bible I have used to house the water glass with which I anoint my fingers while I touch myself. This an alternative to prayer both simple and full of shame. Sometimes the river in the mornings sounds like a hymn, or perhaps just a series of sounds I have forgotten how to assemble. Either way, down the street are the bells. When they ring once for each hour, the water glass ripples in response. Panic attack in the bathroom stall, or I am convinced yet again that my body is ending. Immunity is complicated. It means distinguishing what within us is the self. Sometimes the body is too aware of its bodiness, becomes a current, takes everything despite itself. At the lighthouse in May, 42 days since he fell under. To pray, I find a shell, put it to my ear and open elsewhere in sound. The feral water body foams lip of God wet and unfurling. Praise me anyway, he says. It is somehow louder here than if I were right in front of him. Morning commute after another mass shooting. I am not trying to plead with God, but place him in my body and walk around. Death is everywhere, I want him to think. I want him late for work, stuck behind a funeral procession. I want him to stare too long at the wreckage beside the road, out of irritation but not sorrow. To step on the carcass of a bird, then order coffee and notice only when it drips on the sidewalk. There is no turn in logic here. How is it to be human? There is always something else that keeps us walking. Dissociation, Lake Ontario. Here, an empty tide drawing new rules in the sand. Within the animal me burrows has need for meaning. Every hole seems to fill with water. At once I am here and clamoring toward my surface. I seem to have lost the language of prayer. God, my dropped locket, lost thing, between concrete a flower, a laugh, Prayer is like this, the pre-echo of rain and then, my mind a long dark blue, boundary and etch of the self, fixedness. To listen for him is to wait among my words and fall away. High bun for women who are told to forgive. The old church, Pastor X hits the podium until he beats forgiveness into our mouths. The word coats the tongue like a caramel in the heat, sickly and immovable, a corner store for sinners. This is when I am a girl taught to swallow pain like a lady should. Pinky raised to God like a flag made of doilies, pale quivering flame. 
I am 10 when I walk by a man in the parking lot of that Italian restaurant, the one my father loved, and it is cold. I cannot tell where the smoke ends and his breath begins. In the reflection of the window, he watches me like a secret that cannot be kept, tears the sight of me into something digestible, bread for famished ducks. I, too, pick at my food, this a ritual of God's girlhood. Like a wound forgives a bullet, I close around it, small, yielding mouth. Another time, I am 12, 14, 16, 20. On a date, an older one grabs my wrist and tells me I've been a bad girl. At a church picnic, one rests his palm too far at my leg. Another follows me in the lot and laughs when he sees me clench my car keys like a sixth finger. Pastor X says he's seen it all before. Girl ruins her life with immodesty, ruins it further with a grudge. He says, we're all God's kids, even the whores and the handsy. In my anger, I learn I am not a child. I am either godless or a goddess. I am both. I am shame, miniskirt unraveled like a hymn that haunts the pews, pussy poltergeist. Now I say forgive and a distant church bell chimes, weightless like cold breath. I point my eyes to a new hour, watch the flocks of crows circle the bell tower, as if to say, watch, it will only happen again. I wait for God to lean against the mortar of it, eyeing me up and down as I walk quickly by. Forgiveness, the butt of a menthol cigarette perched between his lips. Thank you. I like that song. You can put it back on. <laughs> hey, all. Thank you for coming out. I'm reading like three pieces, so. <laughs> Just letting you know. We have, what, an hour? You poor fools. Um, so it was interesting to me today when I was thinking about like these pieces that I wanted to read for the speakeasy is there was this really interesting theme that began to emerge among these pieces, even though they kind of don't feel like they fit together. And I realized that when I was writing these, they were really like spurred on by this idea of continuing to write, which I know might sound kind of like a strange idea. But I feel like in like the writing community, we don't talk a lot about what it means when you don't want to continue or when you're like really burned out. Like we're really awesome at helping each other when you have words on the page. Like we can fix all of them. We feel like we can. We can do workshops, we can do all that stuff. But when it comes to like the continuation of it or the going on, we're kind of like really shitty to each other about that. It's like, well, you'll figure it out. Just keep going. And I think that we could be so much better. So this month, I celebrated my seven-year yeah, seven anniversary with my writing group. And for the last four years, we've been doing these prompt projects with the aim in mind to keep going as we've been working through these big projects and all this stuff. So the prompt project that we're working on now is um, reimagining titles of existing work. So I'm going to read to you a piece called The Oddly Colored Carpet, which came from a children's book. If you want to do the prompt project with us, the prompt that is up right now is The King Who Would Be Man, I believe is what it's called. So I'm going to read this one to you. And I've been really interested lately in like shit just going off the rails. I think maybe it's just like a reflection of life happening, and I'm like really interested in that. So um, here we go. Believe me, it was a lovely home, truly. And I know you wouldn't think so from the description alone, because let's just face it, who in their right mind redecorates a beautiful old Victorian in a monochromatic color scheme? In green, of all things. And I mean green, from the drapes to the paint to the furniture to the teacups. I hear what you're saying. Oh, trust me, I do. I was put off at first, too. I thought the thought of hosting any kind of gathering in Kermit the Frog's house was an automatic over my dead body. Imagine the board, their faces, the horror of it all when they're shown the front room and all its Oscar the Grouch glory, but the reviews were off the charts, so I met the agent for reviewing anyway. She turned the key in the lock, nestled deep into the green front door. Kale dreams is what I think she said it was called. We entered the foyer and into a whole new world, the walls a rich shade of hosta, complete with feathery veins of soft celadon that stretched from the floor to ceiling. I thought for sure this place might be a jungle inside, and I was ready for a parrot to swoop through the arched doorways or a monkey to climb up the banister as we moved on to the kitchen. And the kitchen, oh, what I wouldn't give for that kitchen. 
The countertop stretched along the minty walls, its surface bursting in color like a geode, all emerald and pale peridot and chrysoberyl, fused glass perfection. And it abutted the stainless steel six-burner stove, the Flame Master 5000, you know, the one that I've been coveting for years now, even though it'd be a monstrosity in my thin galley. Framed photos of peas and asparagus and broccoli hung on the walls above the adjacent dining table, a long farmhouse-style showpiece, rag-dyed with a hint of sage, so sagey I can almost smell Thanksgiving dinner in the heart of June. The agent led me through the house, smiling as she went and calling out each room as we approached, and here's the olive bathroom and the shamrock bedroom with the dark malachite coverlet trimmed in hand-hooked eyelet lace. Then the den a forest-like nook of dense pines and moss, and just when I thought I would fall head first like Alice down this gorgeous green bunny hole, she stopped and took a deep breath before proceeding. Oh, I did the same thing, because surely she knew what was coming, and it's here that I should add that that deep breath did nothing to save me. Just through the archway, the coup de grace, the formal living room littered with plush velvet divans and matching settees, the agent referred to the hue, oh, sorry, it's a French word, Fouivert, and even swallowed the R for full effect. Smack in the middle sat a wrought iron table topped with a thick slab of praseolite, so clear and green and delicious that you could see all the way through to, the, to that carpet below. A hand-woven affair with thin stripes, the colors of artichoke, arugula, and cilantro, a dream, I'm telling you. I reached down and brushed my fingers over the soft wool and breathed it in, new and earthy like a young lamb straight from the field. I picked up the pin, green ink, of course, ready to sign the agreement, ready to wow the board members with this oasis of their degree, ready to ditch my boring brown carpet and faded blue curtains and that god-awful bedspread that my dear old Nana had embroidered when her eyes started failing and move in permanently. But that's when I saw it. My heart sunk into my tailbone. That lovely carpet, that swath of bucolic perfection was bound on the edges with something so horrid, so shocking. I almost can't bring myself to tell you. Perhaps if I whisper, it will make it more palatable. It was bound thinly, mind you, just a hint, really, but there it was, unmistakable, so out of place, that thread of eggplant surrounding what was, before such a thorough inspection, a masterpiece of rain. Maybe it was the look on my face, or how I gasped, or the way I recoiled from that rug, knocking into a gorgeous chaise the color of fresh-cut grass that made the agent lurch toward me. Everything had been so perfect the kind of perfect I didn't know I needed until right then, and I refused to, to detach from it on account of some reckless weaver binding the edges with mulberry floss. You'd have done the same thing. Dove right down onto the floor and wrenched up a corner of that carpet. The agent's grip on my shoulders was a lot stronger than you'd imagine from such a petite thing. And so was her gruff voice, yelling at me to release the rug and stand up at once. Oh, I know what you're thinking, that I should have let it go. I should have stood up right then and there. But the thing is, I was already elbow deep into my purse, fishing out the nail clippers that I'd carried around since the Stone Ages. When I pressed the nubby little blades against the wool, the agent's eyes grew as big as cabbages. One little snip in that dastardly purple would unravel like a cheap sock. Oh, I yanked on that string like I'd hooked a swordfish, and once it got going, it unstitched itself from the edge with such speed that when it came free, I toppled over and lay sprawled against the legs of a laurel-hued chair. The cry of victory escaping my lips, the rug now liberated of that foul albergine, the house returned to its state of lush viridian perfection. What a lunatic. <laughs> but she was fun. She was fun to play around with. So carrying on, we haven't heard any nonfiction tonight. I kind of had a feeling that maybe we wouldn't. And we have to represent nonfiction, like they're our friends, like, right? Yes, we need to. So this last summer I went to Poland to research this book that I am writing for this program. And it was a complete and utter shit show. I'm just gonna tell you, like, some of you know this because I have commented on it endlessly, that it was really a challenge. And the challenging thing for me in continuing on was being able to divorce the experience that I had in Poland from the excitement of the project that I originally had. Because I did get the information that I was looking for, it was just a really frustrating endeavor. And then like, kind of how do you continue on? Like, how do you go? So I'm gonna read to you, um, this is a nonfiction piece that I wrote about um, a little thing that happened whilst I was in Poland. It kind of sums up my feelings about it. 
It's called a park, a man, a tube sock. This is a good one. From start to finish, the whole thing took less than a minute. Tucked away in a park overlooking Pudguj, the air filled with the springtime chirp of birds and the riotous tones of children in the playground. After days of record rainfall, the sun had finally come out and so had the neighborhood. I sat on the park bench to revel in it, to soak the heat into my bones, to salvage my ever-diminishing opinion of Krakow. And that's when the man appeared. He stalked into the clearing. And to be perfectly honest, I hardly noticed him at first. I had things in my mind, like how was I going to finish researching this book when I had run into every conceivable frustration in the city? Power outages, unexplained closures, and militantly resistant archivists. Whoever this man, or anyone, was doing in the park that day was my last concern, until he stopped. He stood in the center of the clearing and stared at me, the kind of stare that you feel before you see, and sitting alone in the middle of a foreign city, I was reluctant to confirm this stranger's gaze, reluctant to give any ground, to goad, to enable, to involve myself in someone else's agenda, especially a man's. When has that ever ended well for a lone female? And still, his stare was relentless. Furious at the intrusion, my blood rose, ready for whatever this man thought he would throw in my direction. I went through the usual litany of questions that all women recount in these circumstances. How far away is he? Is it too late to run? Where is the crowd? Will I get there in time? What if I don't? Is there a stick nearby? And because I've trained in dojos for years, I had to ask myself the other set of questions. If I kick this motherfucker's ass, break his body down into the smallest pieces, what are the laws in Poland regarding that? Will defending myself against his intentions land me in the Krakow Gulag? Probably. So how far away is he? Is it too late to run? I looked up to find that he hadn't moved at all. He stood in the middle of the clearing, and we stared at each other with the same expression, the fuck you two look that two kinds of people wear sometimes, the brazen and the crazy. I wasn't sure who was who. With his eyes locked on mine and under the sun and the eyes of God and all of the children on the playground, he pulled his pants down. Here it comes, I thought. And I readied my responses. Keep your expression neutral. Don't give him what he most wants, your look of horror and disgust, your fear. Don't give him that power over you that he's seeking. Maybe it's best if you start laughing at him and hold up your thumb and forefinger an inch apart, maybe less. How fun to emasculate him during his primate dominance display. Indicate your amusement at his pathetic act he's about to perform. But perhaps humiliation is his game. Stay neutral. Give him nothing. With unbroken eye contact, he squatted in the clearing and proceeded to take a shit in front of me. The muscles in his face hardening, the strained tension in his neck as he pushed. Even though he was too far away from me to hear it, I watched the sigh escape his body, the small shudder of release across his shoulders. When sharing such an intimate moment, one would imagine our disdain for each other would soften. <laughs> Instead, we wore unrelenting fuck yous on our faces. From somewhere, he produced what looked like a filthy tube sock, reached back with it, and wiped his ass. <laughs> his arm working and digging as he stared at me. <laughs> then he stood, pulled up his pants, left his pile and shit sock behind, and marched out of the park with the same determination from when he first entered the clearing. I watched his back as he passed the playground, the children oblivious to his transgression against us all, and I was glad for it. Glad that the thin thread of their innocence remained intact. I sat on the bench for a long while, allowing this strange man a head start and plenty of time to involve himself elsewhere before I left. And even then, I took the long way out of the park. I took the long way back into the heart of the city and from there, the long way home. I just remembered, like, the last time I was up here, I was reading a story about the Tabasco sauce in the asshole. Remember that? Like, I'm like, what is my fascination? Jeez Louise, what does this say about me? So that was like, um, if one <laughs> event could have summed up, like, my whole experience in Krakow, that was it. And this was like, two days before I left Krakow, like, I was like, wow, what a send-off. Love you too. <laughs> 
And it was really challenging, right? Because from there, I went um, along the Czech border to research these witch trials that I've been studying. And I got a ton of information. I got everything that I needed, but I was so fucking irritated by the time I left that I was like, I'm done with this whole thing. And I had to ask myself when I came back, but how do you keep going, right? Because my work is based in history, which I'd spent a year researching this book. And so for a lot of us, we understand like my, my work is rooted in something. And I spend a lot of time in that space. And if all of a sudden I'm not interested in it, how do I continue? And so for me, it was just this asking of a question like, um, what does it take? for you to, what will it take for you to like move on? And it was like, fuck Poland is what it will take. So I had to just move everything into the Czech Republic. So for me that worked, right? Because this is on a borderland. Um, and for you that might be something. But I was interested also in like, how can I change the perspective? How can I change the, you know, maybe not the physical setting or just the time period in which I do this? And that's how I carried on. So I'm gonna read to you like eight paragraphs. This is the very rough, very first part of what came out of that as I continued and I actually carried on. And then I promise I'll let you go. Thank you for listening to me ramble on. So this is uh, Chanahora, which is, uh, it means Black Mountain in Czech. Uh, it's a made up city or made up little village. And the year is 1643. Late that afternoon, Father Philip arrived at the priory to find a letter tacked to the front door. It had been folded twice into a slim rectangle, half of the bishop's insignia still discernible in the melting wax. The heat had softened the seal enough for the letter to fall open, exposing sloping curls of Latin in the bishop's slanted signature. The small bit of paper fluttered against the wood, the red wax dripping like a wound. He pulled the missive from his door before entering. Once inside, he lit the candle on the small table and held the paper up to the light. Across the top, the salutation began, Father Bartek, my dear brother in Christ. Philip had learned to read as a child, and after all those years of endless study, his eyes would run across the words with a will of their own, over letters that weren't meant to be read, at least not by him, not without permission. He leaned in his chair and glanced out the small window in the direction of St. Anna's. Father Bartek was attending the sick, and afterward, he would conduct the evening's mass there. A melted seal would be easy enough to explain. They'd found many in a similar condition before, an unavoidable complication of the late summer heat. Philip looked back down at the letter and thought to refold it and set it aside until his eyes fell to the middle of the page. The artist has left Wrocław and with any luck will arrive shortly after this letter. But Father Bartek, there is something you must know about your sculptor. The artist had been a thorn in Philip's side from the moment Bartek proposed the idea of the sculpture. His fellow priests had seen the artist's work in Wrocław and insisted upon something for St. Andrews that could compete with the colored rose windows and the carved altarpieces in the neighboring village churches, or in the very least, set it apart in its own special way. A weeping Madonna, or the Assumption, perhaps Mary with the baby Jesus. It took five letters and nearly a year to convince the diocese to send the funds, and when they finally relented, the local artisans guild all but called for Bartek's head on a pike for going around them and hiring a foreigner to do the work. There were rules. Even Philip himself had thought the man had stepped out of line, and now this. Philip unfolded the letter and smoothed it flat on the table, then read it in one go from top to bottom, his lips pulling into a smile as he finished. He shook his head and chuckled softly to himself. Yes. There's something you must know about your sculptor, he said, as he held the paper over the candle's flame, the fire licking the corner, then consuming the parchment altogether. Mm. <laughs> Thank you.